What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Pierre Richard has been involved with Bitcoin as a researcher, investor, and software developer since February 2013. He co-founded the Satoshi Nakamoto Institute to curate the best primary source literature on Bitcoin and cryptography. In addition to developing Bitcoin software, Pierre is an outspoken advocate for Bitcoin's decentralized governance. In 2017, he began co-hosting the noted Bitcoin podcast. Pierre is widely recognized as an authority on the investment case for Bitcoin. Pierre Rochard, welcome back to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast for the fourth time. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, man. It's great to see you. Uh, it's been a while, uh, probably over six, seven months. How is 2021 treating you? Uh, fantastically well. Uh, this is a bull market that is off to a great start. And uh, uh, good news seems to come out every day. Yeah, very cool. You know, a lot of the stuff that I've learned from your writings or your tweets has kind of really uh, resonated or permeated a lot in 2021 for myself uh, in terms of your uh, landmark article, Speculative Attack, which was uh, released on July 4th, 2014. So almost seven years ago to the day, uh, it's almost two Bitcoin cycles. Uh, the fact that you've been writing on Bitcoin for that long, you've been in this space for a while. What have you made so far of this year in terms of um, the price action and, and some of the narratives that are, are happening right now? Yeah, I think that this year has helped separate the fixed from the variable. So what I mean by that is that um, some people look at Bitcoin or they, they look at certain aspects of it and they think that uh, it will never change. Um, and that this, so for example, I'll bring up China, um, all of this mining in China, um, it's always been a talking point by critics of Bitcoin to bring up how much hash rate is concentrated in China. Um, what we're seeing is uh, either that hash rate is moving abroad uh, or uh, it actually is uh, China is preparing for an attack on Bitcoin. <laughs> um, I, I think my, my, I lean towards the former. Uh, I think that it's far more likely that the hash rate is actually moving out of China. Um, and that uh, it, it, it highlights the dynamic nature of hash rate, um, which is uh, misunderstood by the critics. So even if there is an attack, though, I also think that it'll, it'll bring out the dynamic nature of the network in other ways as well, and that the attack will un ultimately be unsuccessful. Um, and and we'll we'll see that happen in real time, but um, the other part of it that is dynamic is how uh, external parties see Bitcoin. So there was this narrative, and there still is very much so that governments are inherently hostile towards Bitcoin, and El Salvador uh, proved that to be false because all governments don't necessarily control their own currency. Um, and that we'll, we'll actually see a wide variety of responses from governments to Bitcoin. The other one is about the banks, that it, uh, it was perceived that banks would always be hostile towards Bitcoin. But NYDIG's work uh, in working with banks and, and building those relationships and helping onboard banks so that they can offer buying and selling of Bitcoin on their platforms uh, is also violating that, that narrative. And I think that, um, you know, CBDC, just the threat of CBDC of central banks cutting into the business of commercial banks by uh, having a direct relationship with consumers um, is, is part of that dynamic. Um, so yeah, I think that 
there were a lot of misunderstandings about what in the incentives are of this system and a lot of hand, hand wringing over nothing uh, where um, there's there's just a lot of, uh, even among Bitcoin proponents, folks who are pretty um, timid and uh, not realistic about um, what the incentives are. Uh, and 2021 has, um, you know, really rewarded those Bitcoiners who are bold. Uh, I'd highlight Jack Mahlers, for example, um, but also the, the team at NYDIG. Um, and uh, they, they are the ones who are actually making progress and driving it forward. Yeah. Two things uh, out of all of that, that, you know, because you, you laid a lot down there that really stick out for me was one, I think, you know, it's uh, really possible that a lot of people can be blinded by their own incentives. Maybe that's what makes it hard to see other people's incentives. Uh, and maybe that's the trap. And then something I, get, I really get from your work is that there are two sides to everything. Or, or the kind of the way you you look at a situation, and you know, with Bitcoin we have a truth machine, but everything else, it's like with China, are they making a multi general generational mistake by letting the hash rate leave the country? With El Salvador, I'm kind of curious what you think about this initiative, this rollout, specifically with government wallets, and, and whether there's more to this than we're thinking through in the long term, both positive and negative. Um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, if we look at the history of uh, technology, um, there we could uh, we could point to governments bungling things. Um, but there are, it's actually not um, outside the realm of possibility uh, to have a government initiative actually uh, work. <laughs> um, and uh, especially if they get the technology right, and they're building on an open protocol. Um, and so we could point to the government's involvement with the internet. Um, I don't know how they, how much their involvement actually helped. Um, but I, I actually, in the context of El Salvador, uh, I think about my, my home country, France, and uh, it, it used to promote nuclear power. And um, I believe there's still like 70% nuclear power. And that was a good move. Uh, that, that was a really smart move uh, and, and made them far less reliant on importing uh, natural gas from, um, you know, fairly volatile regions. Um, so it is, I think, possible to have, and, and I would also point to things like, um, it's especially important with network effects. So like electrification, uh, you know, uh, having uh, a basic infrastructure, as they call it. Um, and, I, you know, I, I'm happy to, to debate uh, whether these things would happen even without the government. Um, but I, I think that they could, they could accelerate the adoption of a new technology uh, by making it mandatory. And um, I don't know. It's uh, on one hand, I don't like it because I am, you know, philosophically a libertarian. On the other hand, I look at what the playing field is and I see a lot of governments that want to destroy Bitcoin and uh, they want to, they do want to ban it. Um, and so uh, in terms of negotiation, I think that it's good to start with uh, let's make Bitcoin required and then we'll meet in the middle. Okay. Then, okay. Well, we don't want to require Bitcoin. We don't want to ban Bitcoin. All right, let's meet in the middle. Let's just make it optional. Right. Uh, and so it's important that, um, you know, because if we take the libertarian approach, then we start the negotiation and, Hey, we should, we should be allowed to do this and governments start the negotiation with, no, it should be completely banned. And then we meet in the middle where some uses of it are banned. Uh, you know, we have to do um, all sorts of crazy KYC stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, maybe in some countries they have it where you can use it as a store of value, but you're not allowed to use it for payments. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that it's really important uh, to start the negotiation at uh, everyone's going to be required to use Bitcoin. Everyone's going to be forced to use it. 
uh, and you know, we could even start the negotiation at like uh, you, everyone's stock portfolio has to be like 10% in Bitcoin, uh, you know, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. We'll, uh, you know, re relax our negotiation position as they relax theirs. Um, but there's a lot of, um, like naive libertarians, uh, especially in think tanks and around Washington, DC, uh, who, who think that opening the negotiation, um, at the libertarian position, uh, is how to win on policy. And they've been devastatingly wrong for decades now. Uh, they've really accomplished nothing. Right. Yeah. One, also something that is interesting with El Salvador is I can't help but think, because I, I don't know the president of El Salvador. I don't know any presidents, but I do notice that he's very young and he's youthful. And I wonder how much that has enabled him to embrace this technology versus you know our leadership here, which is much older. I'm not sure if you kind of have commentary on just sort of the age of pol you know, politicians yeah. involved in this. So there's definitely the the technology part. I think there's also the um, the price volatility. So uh, being risk averse versus being risk seeking. Uh, as you get older, you naturally get more risk averse and you want to have like, you know, uh, two percent bonds, you know, have zero volatility. <laughs> um, but as you're younger, uh, you can um, have a longer view of things and see that you can you can tolerate the volatility. Um, I, I think that he also he had a tweet from 2017 saying that he was pro Bitcoin, basically. Um, so I don't think it's new either, and he's been through a bear market, and uh, so I think that he understands that. Um, it's something that he'll be able to tolerate. And then the other part is the career. So he's got uh, several decades ahead of him of political career. And if he bets big on Bitcoin now and it turns out to really be super successful, um, then he's he's made his career. I mean, he could be, I don't know if they have term limits or whatever, but um, he could be a power broker in El Salvador for the coming decades and El Salvador would become the wealthiest nation in the world. Uh, so um, I think that being young, you can think longer term like that uh, beyond the next halving cycle. Yeah. How well do you think he's positioned the country or, or could position the country via this move, this strategic uh, or this strategy? Yeah, I think that um, it's, it's going to require a lot of, um, good decisions to get it to the right place uh, because um, it is vulnerable to corruption, to outside influence, to shitcoining. Um, but uh, if he, and it seems like he's playing his cards right um, and establishes basically a Bitcoin sovereign wealth fund uh, where um, El Salvador has a lot of capital uh, put aside in, in Bitcoin, um, then there, first of all, will be the first order impact that, you know, the, the government will have lots of wealth. Um, but the other thing is that if he is able to, um, get El Salvadorians, both individuals and companies, uh, to hold Bitcoin, uh, that they're going to do really well in the private sector as well. Um, the challenge I think is going to be to, first of all, persuade, El Salvadorians that they should save in Bitcoin in this highly volatile uh, asset and that the returns will compensate them for that volatility, um, which is, you know, it can be a challenging argument to make. Uh, but, you know, there's the Milgram experiment where you have an authority figure telling you to do something that you don't want to do and you do it anyway. So this actually might be a, a positive version of the Milgram experiment where you have uh, the head of state endorsing Bitcoin and telling people to save in Bitcoin and uh, you know the sheep will go along with it uh, and it actually turns out well for them. Um, the other problem though is like the security of the private keys. Uh, so, you know, are people going to lose their coins uh, left and right because they don't have the right training, et cetera, the right software? Um, and then the, um, the honeypot part where uh, if you have this big 
big sovereign wealth fund with lots of Bitcoin in it. You know, somebody going to walk away with that money uh, and put it into their slush fund retirement account. Um, but yeah, these are these are these are solvable problems, right? Like we we have multi-sig. Um, there there are solutions, and it's just going to be a matter of uh, folks on the ground there uh, implementing them and uh, adapting and educating. Yeah, I think the two things you bring up there that really strike me are, you know, whether there'll be state surveillance of these uh, wallets and, and to what capacity. And, and the second one, which is slipping my mind at the moment. Um, okay, yeah, it was more around the securing of Bitcoin at a sovereign nation state level and whether that is actually possible and whether at some point uh, whether that's temporal or existential, because at some point, some human will have, uh, whether you do multi-sig or not, whether it's one human or multiple humans will have access to those Bitcoin and like you said, could run off with them or, or something to that effect. And, and I, you know, I think that's a, a whole different rabbit hole. Uh, I'd really like to turn our attention to speculative attacks and, and your article that you wrote on July 4, 2014. So I'm kind of curious whether you remember what inspired you to write this article or what you were thinking and, and why you picked that release date and, and even the artwork that's associated with, with the article. Yeah, absolutely. So um, <laughs> my, my thought process was um, how, how is, how does the adoption of a money actually happen? And um there was just a lot of noise and there still is a lot of noise about what drives adoption in uh, for Bitcoin or the crypto industry. Right. Um, and I would say there's, there's two major schools of thought. There's the utility school of thought of, well, we have to have lots of useful features and useful products that uh, folks will be drawn towards crypto or uh, you know cryptocurrencies, um, and the other school of thought is the the kind of the value scarcity ish school of thought, right? Which is that um, what 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 matters is that you're able to verify the scarcity of the asset, and that's the first time in history it's possible, and um, because and, and Bitcoin's the only one that's actually engineered to, to optimize for this. Um, and that is actually what will make people adopt Bitcoin as a savings technology uh, so that people will actually want to hold this asset. Um, and the utility part is neither here nor there because when they actually do want to use another blockchain or a smart contract, um, you can acquire the utility token on the spot market instantly. So there's never any incentive to hold it as a long-term uh, asset, uh, whereas with Bitcoin, there is. Um, and then there's, so that's kind of the a debate internal within the crypto sphere. Um, externally, there's the, so the, the fiat shills, they a lot of them are still in the mindset that the reason Bitcoin is competitive with dollars or any other fiat currency is about payments. And so they are still in the payments mindset that was basically, you know, the um, Bcash, Roger Veer uh, type of mindset of uh, w the way Bitcoin is competitive is by having low transaction fees and that's why people adopt Bitcoin. Um, and that I think, um, uh, it, it's 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 wrong. Uh, that's not what what drives Bitcoin adoption. Uh, and I would contrast it with the uh, NGU uh, school of thought, right? That the only reason people get interested in Bitcoin and stick around in Bitcoin is because of the exchange rate, is because of Bitcoin's purchasing power and it trending up, and that um, you actually don't really care about uh, transaction fees. If your purchasing power is increasing, 
So if you went from having $3,000 worth of Bitcoin to $30,000 worth of Bitcoin and transaction fees go from $3 to $30, uh, you're still very far ahead. <laughs> you know, you, you you don't really care that that happened. Um, but uh, even that aside, you know, we could get into lightning and whatnot. But um, so then it's like, all right, if if we're in the NGU school of thought, um, is there a tipping point where um, how how does adoption happen? Does it just happen linearly? You know, we get like one additional person at a time uh, and uh, one more saver a day um or uh is there something else going on so i was um i was already familiar with uh speculative attacks uh as a general concept in currency markets um and it did strike me as that so what is a speculative attack it's basically how um it, it, it's how currencies, um, let's see where, how to frame it. Um, so w without the constraint of a gold standard, uh, so if you don't have, uh, if you don't have to worry about uh, keeping a peg to gold, uh, then there's not really in, in, in a vacuum, there's nothing stopping you from printing infinite amount of money. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the MMT uh, folks uh, are always ecstatic to point that out, that we don't have a gold standard anymore, so money printing uh, can go on forever. Um, what is generally missing from their analysis is that uh, they you don't have the only fiat currency in the world. There are other fiat currencies around the world. And so every fiat currency is actually competing with other fiat currencies. And um, what are they competing for? They're competing for people holding that currency. Uh, there are people who, uh, and then the the market makers are the currency traders, the currency speculators who are setting the price, the exchange rate between these different currencies. And so in the worst case scenario, your currency completely collapses and everyone in your country adopts a foreign currency as their money. And that has happened. That's what happened in El Salvador. They dollarized. And so people will use US dollars in that country um, because the local currency got wiped out. So how to prevent that from happening, how to prevent a stronger currency from replacing your weaker currency is there's two modalities. One is by raising interest rates. So raising interest rates makes it more attractive to uh, get into that currency. Um, and then assuming, and really you, you've got to look at real interest rates, right? So real interest rates being the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. Um, and so that, that'll that give you what you're actually earning. Um, and uh, having high real interest rates is expensive because uh, that has to come from somewhere. Uh, you know, that's not a, a free lunch. Um, and the the other way though is through financial repression. So you make it illegal to have foreign currencies uh, in this country. Uh, you make it illegal to um, speculate on the currency. You have a fixed exchange rate. Um, you, you know, execute people who are speculating on foreign exchanges. And this, that's like how Iran functions. So like, uh, you know, there's stories of people getting beheaded in Iran for speculating on currencies. Um, and you know they'll, they'll moralize about it, about how you know it's it's evil, and uh, you're just like making money off of inflation, and uh, speculators are the devil. Um, so those are the two two big ways of of fighting against a stronger currency. So if we say, all right, well, Bitcoin's a stronger currency, um, then either central banks are going to have to raise interest rates to compete with Bitcoin, and what does that mean? So in, in monetary economics, uh, there's two things that a central bank can target. One is money supply, and the other is interest rates. Um, Bitcoin, if we conceive of Bitcoin as a central bank, Bitcoin targets the money supply. So that's what the difficulty adjustment's about. That's what the halvings are about, um, which is that we're going to increase the money supply by 6.25 Bitcoin every 10 minutes, which means that the interest rate is fle freely floating. So that's why like when people on uh, Twitter talk about the funding rate 
or they talk about the futures curve uh, and they'll talk about contango and backwardation and all of this, they're, they're really talking about how volatile Bitcoin's interest rate is because it is freely floating, whereas the supply is uh, what's being targeted. Central banks generally do the opposite. They target the interest rate, and so they have a stable interest rate, you know, 0% or whatever it is. Uh, and then the money supply is highly volatile. So you've seen that chart of the like the US dollar money supply just is like going vertical uh, because of, uh, you know, COVID and whatnot. Um, so in order to compete with Bitcoin, they would have to target money supply. So they'd have to say, all right, well, we're no longer printing US dollars. Like whatever it is now is going to be it forever. So we're $20 trillion. We're going to target that to stay the same. And then dollar interest rates are going to freely float. Um, this was done once in uh, at the end of uh, the 1970s by Paul Volcker, uh, and it caused interest rates to go up to 20%. It only went up to 20% because they were only competing against gold. Gold, which has a, uh, a supply that is and was increasing more than gold, or sorry, Bitcoin supply now. Now Bitcoin has a higher stock to flow ratio than gold. And so to compete with Bitcoin, interest rates on fiat would have to go above 20% which is just based on the, the, where they went last time they did this. Um, and they did that at the end of the 1970s because there was essentially a speculative attack happening on the dollar using gold. And um, that's, that, that would have caused the dollar to collapse if they had not uh, raised interest rates like this. So not only, though, not only is there the money supply, um, the monetary policy of Bitcoin is better than gold's, but every other property of it is better than gold, right? Uh, the ability to uh, have uh, multi-sig or private keys or sending, you know, magic internet money at 24-7, 365 uh, to anyone in the world. So really it's not some, it, so not only would they have to raise interest rates above 20% because of the better monetary policy, but then it, add on to the top of that, all of the other fundamental properties of Bitcoin and you're talking like basically 50%, right? That's 50%, I think, is the average annual value increase of Bitcoin uh, or since 2014, I think, is uh, if I'm pulling that stat from, I think Hasma Cook was uh, highlighting this. So imagine a world where the US dollar interest rate is 50%. The, the entire debt pyramid collapses. Uh, they can't do that. So their other option is financial repression. You know, shut down the Bitcoin exchanges, make it illegal, ban it. Um, and that's what um, Brad Sherman wants to do. Uh, but it looks like there's nobody else in Congress who wants to do this. So if financial repression is not an option and raising interest rates is not an option, I don't know. Seems like uh, the dollar's cooked. Fair enough. I, I agree with you there. I, I don't know how it plays out exactly. Uh, I, so sometimes in my mind, I think it's going to be very aggressive. Sometimes uh, I think this can go on for a long, long time. What I think is really fascinating about this article and these ideas we're talking about is you, you mentioned someone like Roger Ver, and, and we don't need to get into Roger, but you're dealing with a lot of ideas here in the wild, wild west of not just ideas, but in practice. And, and I think I, I'm guessing your, your, your knowledge of monetary policy, economics, and history is what helped you wade through sort of these waters and, and, and figure out what, what, the, what the anchor is and, and to not get in, involved in payments technology or these other kind of narratives. And I'm kind of curious what you think about the, the FUD we're experiencing now from Elon Musk to Elizabeth Warren to Donald Trump. Does, does any of this surprise you anymore? Have the arguments of Bitcoin against Bitcoin ever changed? Um, no, I mean, the, 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 the energy argument was one of the first responses to Satoshi's white paper um, on the mailing list, uh, you know, before Bitcoin was consuming uh, any electricity at all. Um, and same thing with the scaling 
uh, the uh, scalability of the system was one of the first responses to Satoshi. So um, they're not coming up with any new criticisms. These are all, uh, you know, well-trodden ground. Um, the only difference would be their ability to do something about it. Um, and uh, it's interesting, you know, e Elon Musk, all he can do about it is just not buy Bitcoin or sell the Bitcoin he's already bought. Um, that's that's really all he can do about it, uh, and 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 squeal on Bitcoin uh, on Twitter. Um, but um, and and then if we look at Senator Warren, in theory, right, a senator could propose legislation and get legislation passed that would do something about it. Uh, in practice, it doesn't seem like anybody else has any any of the other senators are willing to stick their necks out on this. Um, it's just not uh, something where, and it's interesting in, in, in political economy um, or um, in, um, oh, now I forget the uh, school of thought. There's, so there's um, an economic school of thought that, that looks at the economics of regulation and the economics of legislation, public choice theory. Mm -hmm. And um, basically the way that you get a law passed is by having a concentrated benefit with a diffuse cost. Um, and so here they have the opposite. There's a concentrated cost, right? On the crypto industry and on crypto holders who will very loudly complain and lobby. And the benefit is very diffuse of saying, well, we want the dollar to be the world reserve currency uh, and that is good for Americans because it reduces the cost of imports. And so if every American you know, benefits from lower cost imports you know, by a nickel and um, you have uh, the crypto industry that is uh, you know, making lots of money off of uh, buying and selling Bitcoin, uh, then it's just not conceivable that they would be able to get any legislation through. And, you know, who's going to call their congressman and be like, I'm excited about the dollar being the world reserve currency, and I need you to support Elizabeth Warren in her crusade against Bitcoin. Um, it just doesn't exist. There's no constituency for Keynesianism. Um, Keynesianism is something that is like foisted onto uh, people and uh, it wouldn't really work um, if it wasn't for the fact that the, um, this, the, the monetary system became so centralized. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm kind of also want to turn back to currency crisis and, and your thinking coming out of, we're going into 2013 with Bitcoin, but also Cyprus. And, and if you could kind of detail or explain what happened there and maybe what, how that impacted your thinking. Yeah, so uh, Cyprus had um, a, a, a crisis where they had to do what's called a bank bail-in instead of a bank bail-out. Uh, so a bail-in is where you have um, the depositors at the bank have to take a haircut on their deposit. So I think it was like 15% off the top that uh, they, and, and then to enforce this, they had a period where they froze everyone's bank accounts so that they could apply the haircut. And so there was like a bank holiday and um, this caused, uh, uh, and this was like in April, 2013, um, lots of uh, Bitcoiners were like, oh, what a great opportunity. Let's have mass adoption of Bitcoin in Cyprus now. And uh, there was rumors that uh, Cyprus was adopting Bitcoin because obviously wouldn't you adopt Bitcoin if uh, the government was doing this to you? Um, and I actually, I thought, I thought that there was some truth to it, that uh, that, that was happening. Um, and, you know, there'd be like uh, Reddit posts about it and whatnot. Um, but when the dust settled, uh, people were like, no, there's, there's no more adoption of Bitcoin here than there was before. Um, and it made me think that, first of all, all of the... All of the news um, is generally noise. 
And um, people were saying that the Bitcoin price was going up because Cyprus was adopting Bitcoin. The reality was that we only found out after the fact the Bitcoin price was going up because the Winklevi twins were buying Bitcoin. <laughs> and uh, so it's not like, uh, and, and of course, there had just been the halving the year before. And so uh, supply was down. Um, so what I learned from that is that it's very easy for people to get caught up in narratives that are not based in reality. And they think that the price is driven by those narratives, but that it's just not necessarily the case. Um, the price generally is, is driven by actual real cash flows of um, people buying and selling Bitcoin, uh, not by um, whatever is in the news that day. Yeah. Speaking of that, and buying and selling Bitcoin and what drives you know, the actual price and, and vis a vis cash flows is can, can you talk about like how momentum trading and people being levered up or leveraged trading impacts? you know, daily or monthly, weekly Bitcoin action? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when, when, so let's say uh, the bear market or the, the bull market started on March 12th, 2020 uh, with the crash down to 3K. Um, and then it, it kind of went up slowly there uh, until it went parabolic to 60K. And the, the reason that it went parabolic is that you can never have a price that just slowly drifts upward. Um, the reason you can't have that is because of momentum traders. So uh, people, there's um, a school of thought within trading of uh, chasing trends. So you flip through charts until you find one that has a trend where it's just like slowly drifting upwards and uh, or it's, it's drifting downwards, in which case you would go short. But if it's drifting upwards, you go long. And um, that's why you have people pile in and then it it has reflexivity to it. So um, as momentum traders go in, it causes it to drift upwards more at a higher rate. Um, and then you get the leverage traders. The leverage traders, they were always there in a sense, right? So you've got leverage traders, you know, when it's trending upwards. Um, and they are reinvesting their profits into increasing their leverage. Uh, and so you have an amplification of leverage and then you have new folks coming into the market who are like, wow, uh, if I lever up, then I can really make a lot of money. Um, you also have a behavioral finance phenomenon of when, um, when a trade is going your way, your risk tolerance increases. So, what that causes is that um, you go all in at the top <laughs> is basically the uh, mm -hmm. behavioral result of your risk tolerance increasing uh, as the price is going your way um, and, and vice versa. When the price is going down, people's risk tolerance decreases. So they, they panic sell. Uh, and so that's why most people panic buy the top and panic sell the bottom because they're um, behavioral bias is telling them to do that. Whereas uh, folks who have transcended their behavioral biases, you know, are able to uh, sell the top and buy the bottom. Um, now, all this to say that I, I think the, the right approach for folks is to just not try to time the market at all and to be dollar cost averaging regardless of what's going on. And by dollar cost averaging, let me be very specific about this because this gets endlessly debated on Twitter. Um, what I mean by that is that you should be making your decision to acquire Bitcoin, not based on Bitcoin's exchange rate. Rather than looking externally at the exchange rate, you should be looking internally at your financial situation. So what you need to do is you need to sit down with your wife or your husband uh, or uh, all by yourself, <laughs> uh, depending on what your situation is, and you need to project your future cash flows. So you need to look at, all right, how much do I make every week? What are some contingency, contingencies that can happen? What are my goals? You know, when am I gonna pay for my vacation? Etc. So you lay out the next, you know, five years of cash flows, 
Uh, how, you know, do, am I expecting a raise? Am I expecting to change my career uh, or vice versa? Do, am I expecting to be unemployed? Um, you know, et cetera. Um, and then you need to figure out, okay, well, how much fiat do I need to put aside in order to be prepared for any downside contingencies? And how much fiat do I have left over to put into Bitcoin? And if you follow this decision-making process, you're not looking at Bitcoin's exchange rate at all. Rather, you're looking at what are you able to put aside in long-term savings. And this means that you'll be able to hold even in extremely volatile conditions, and you'll be able to accumulate uh, whether the price is going up or down. Um, and that's what's going to allow you to survive. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you get into active trading, then uh, your, your, your instincts are going to be working against you. And that's where you really, you got to be a professional trader to make that work. Um, most people are not professional traders and even professional traders lose money. So, um, you know, if, if you're looking at this long term, uh, you really have to base your decisions on your own financial situation, not on what the market's doing. Yeah. <laughs> It's very interesting there you bring up uh, economic calculations. And one, I don't think they get, that gets taught at all at school, this sort of like financial management responsibility and thinking through your personal cash flows and whatever that might entail. And, and I want to jump before we get to more of the rational or economic or um, sort of the financial side of that equation. I want to a, bring up a little bit from your article and talk more about the emotional side of what you're getting at here. So you wrote back in 2014, Bitcoin naysayers wring their hands over how Bitcoin can't go mainstream. They gleefully worry that Bitcoin will not make it across the innovation chasm. One, it's too complicated. Two, it doesn't have the right governance structure. Three, the security is too hard to get right. Four, Existing and upcoming fiat payment systems are or will be superior. Five, it's too volatile. Six, the government will ban it. Seven, it won't scale. And you kind of mentioned that the response from the Bitcoin community is to either endlessly argue over the above points or to find their inner Bitcoin Jonah with platitudes like Bitcoin, the currency doesn't matter. It's the blockchain technology that matters. It would be better if the blockchain technology were used by banks and governments Bitcoin should continue to be a niche, a niche system for the bit curious. It's just an experiment. Fiat and Bitcoin will live side by side heavily, happily ever after. Bitcoin is the MySpace of virtual currency. The above sophisms are each worth their own article just to analyze the psychosocial archetypes of the relevant parrots. I, I can't agree more. <clears throat> and it's so interesting that you wrote this so many years ago and we kind of keep seeing the same thing over and over and over. And I kind of want you to kind of expand on what you mean by ADHD, FOMO, and post-internet uh, stress disorder, aka disruption, in terms of uh, the reduction in information uh, symmetry. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, it's funny. Absolutely nothing has changed <laughs> since I wrote that article. Uh, it's all the same stuff. Uh, just being rehashed over and over uh, by uh, increasingly wealthy and powerful people, right? That's the only thing that's changed. Well, and what amazes me by that are the, a lot of the voices that were at your disposal then all took a lot of that uh, on, whether it was Roger Ver at all. And, mm -hmm. and you had to sift through that back then. That's why I wanted to really outline that because it hasn't changed, but except for the education that is available. And, and I still don't think, you know, that, that this is necessarily getting through or that the education is, is at the peak of where it's going to be, et cetera. But back then it was way less and you had to sift through that. So, you know, that's why I want to outline that. Yeah. Um, so I, I had an advantage in that I was interested in the topic of sound money since like 2005. Um, and I was already like a gold bug into 100% uh, reserve banking and all this stuff. So um, that's that's what gave me a framework to to look at this uh, with um, a particular uh, bias, I guess, that I think is uh, turning out to be perennial, right? That it's uh, withstood the test of time. 
Um, so uh, with regards to uh, those, those three psychological um, motives for learning about Bitcoin, so ADHD is, is something that, um, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd self-diagnose myself as being a little bit ADHD. Um, and uh, the, the thing there being that um, you seek out novelty. So uh, you, you're looking for distractions, right? You're looking for something. And there's, uh, it's, it's one way of going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole is that, um, you know, your professor is telling you that you have to learn about, um, I don't know, whatever topic, uh, you know, literature or whatever, and you're procrastinating and you want to learn about Bitcoin instead. Um, and so that, or, you know, you're bored at your job and you're just like browsing the internet and uh, here's an interesting topic to, to learn about. Um, so that reduces the information asymmetry. Uh, then there's the FOMO, which is uh, what we now call NGU technology um, mm. of uh, being like, wow, the price is going up a lot. I should learn about Bitcoin. And then you go learn about Bitcoin um, or uh, you buy some Bitcoin and then and then you say, okay, I should learn about this now that I bought it. Um, and then there's the uh, post-internet stress disorder. Um, uh, the, so this is where um, people will say things like, uh, well, I, I don't want I, I don't want to become obsolete. You know, I don't want to become Kodak. I don't want to become Blockbuster. I have to always uh, be thinking about what the next wave of innovation is going to be in the digital economy. Um, and a lot of those people end up, uh, you know, in blockchain technology. Uh, but um, some of them, especially in the investment world, do end up in the Bitcoin uh, camp. And they're, they're looking for the next disruptive investment, not technology. Uh, and, and Bitcoin fits that uh, rather well. Um, and then, you know, they get sucked into the technology as well. So, yeah, those, those are kind of the three where um, I, I think that it causes people to go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, I, I, do, I also want to read a little bit more from the article where you continue on at the end of the postscript. But no, seriously, there are people on the Internet spending a non-trivial amount of time writing about a currency they think is going to fail yet continues to succeed beyond anyone's expectations. Um, I guess Schnaff and Fraud from Schlack of Schnaff and Fraud, granted a few of them are being paid to write controversial clickbait and or con just control concern trolling. Both activities that you respect and understand, I guess, Pierre. Uh, this is generally stated by people who are in the out group and fantasize about being in the in group through politics pedigree rather than economic meritocratic processes Demographically, they probably overlap with fans of The Secret. Economically, they are, without exception, bezlers. Here's the one I think is really interesting. Bitcoin has entered its eternal September, where every person new to Bitcoin thinks they have a unique understanding of Bitcoin, and everyone ought to hear about it. There's an endless flood of newbies concerned about such and such problem with Bitcoin. The Bitcoin community does these a disservice by taking them seriously instead of just telling them, read more. And you elaborate on the Bitcoin Jesus, uh, or the opposite of Bitcoin Jesus, Bitcoin Jonah is a defeatist, self-sabotaging and timid man who is on a permanent quest to confirm Bitcoin's weakness. You know, it, it's interesting how none of this really changes like we were saying before, but, you know, that you were able to kind of not just see this from again, an economic standpoint, but also an emotional one. And I, I'd love to, to have you elaborate on what is Tears Law and, and what that means. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, people love to cite Gresham's Law. So Gresham's Law is the inverse of Tears Law, but it's more familiar. So let's start with Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law is arguably the most misunderstood law in monetary economics. And it is often summarized as good money drives, or sorry, bad money drives out good money. And the, um, the, the superficial take, the uh, layperson's understanding of Gresham's law is that 
if you go to the supermarket and they have an option to pay in Bitcoin or an option to pay in dollars, that you're going to pay in dollars because uh, you don't want to spend your Bitcoin because it's going to go up in value and, and thus Bitcoin will not circulate and only dollars will circulate uh, in the economy. Um, so the problem with, with this superficial view of Gresham's law is Tears law, which is that what about the merchant? Why are they accepting a currency that's going to go down in value? Why, why would they do that? And um, that's where this uh, this narrative falls apart, which is that the merchant would say, no, you have to pay me in Bitcoin <laughs> because th this is going to go down in value. Um, and so that's Tears Law. And uh, it, it, so this the what what Gresham's Law actually is, is that if the government forces a fixed exchange rate between good money and bad money, that bad money will drive out good. So it's only in the context where the government is forcing a fixed exchange rate. If there is a floating exchange rate, Gresham's law does not apply, Tears law applies, and the merchant will not accept dollars because the merchant does not want to have fun staying poor. <laughs> uh, and so that's, um, that's and, and very few people know about Tears law uh, and very few people understand uh, the real Gresham's law. And, uh, um, Robert Mundell, who is uh, linked to in that um, piece, uh, he wrote a perfect exposition of what Gresham's Law actually is. And um, it's unfortunate that even within the Bitcoin community, there are people who think that uh, Gresham's Law applies. And that's why we're not seeing the adoption of Bitcoin for retail payments. Um, I think that's incorrect. The reason that we're not seeing adoption for retail payments is business owners, small and large business owners, uh, you know, not wanting to hold Bitcoin, not being bullish on Bitcoin, uh, thinking that it's too volatile and that the returns are, you know, not not there. And so, um, once that changes, then we'll see almost overnight that uh, everyone's uh, transacting, paying in Bitcoin. Um, but really, it's it's about turning merchants into uh, hodlers, into uh, you know bull being bullish on Bitcoin, um, and it's not really about the fact that people are reluctant to spend their Bitcoin. Uh, you know, people because here's the, here's the fallacy: if you did not spend your dollars, you could buy more Bitcoin. <laughs> so you have the ex you're missing out on the upside anyway. Uh, it's it's just. Um, it, it's yeah a, a fallacy through and through yeah I, I, that's interesting especially for the merchant side i really like how you look at it from that angle i'm really curious though before this gets uh, way out of my thought process why did you release this article on july 4th that particular date uh pure coincidence uh i um yeah that that was not <laughs> intentional um but uh, with hindsight now, I'd say uh, it was fortuitous, you know, uh, freedom and uh, <laughs> firework. <laughs> um, but no, that was that was a coincidence of, um, uh, yeah, um, just a board on a summer day. I, I hear you. Um, it's really interesting how you in, in the article you talk about um, sort of looking at Bitcoin from the balance sheet side. And most people think that, about it, I think, from the asset side. And if maybe you could kind of describe how most people, you know, they think through it, like where I'm going to allocate a certain percentage of my holdings to it. And that's from the asset side. But if you could elaborate on what that means. Yeah, absolutely. So um, everyone has a balance sheet that has um, three things. One is your assets. Uh, the other is your, so what you own. And then you have your liabilities, what you owe. So your car loan, your mortgage, your student loan debt, those are all liabilities. And then the difference between those two is your net worth. Uh, not your self-worth, that's different, but your net worth. So uh, your um, how much you're worth on paper, if you were to sell all of your assets and you, were a, uh, you, you settled all of your liabilities, uh, that's your net worth. And um, if you 
if you look at your ownership of Bitcoin as a percentage of your assets, that's going to be a different calculation than if you look at it as a percentage of your net worth. Um, and um, so in the US, especially, uh, almost everyone has liabilities. Uh, why does almost everyone have liabilities? Well, uh, the banking industrial complex, uh, the central bankers and the commercial bankers and the politicians have heavily subsidized uh, taking on liabilities. So um, especially when it comes to mortgages uh, to pay for uh, real estate. And, um, and then same thing for student loans to pay for um, uh, education, quote unquote, indoctrination, right? Cultural Marxism. <laughs> um, but um, this was all done to uh, make, make it more affordable, right? And the, the fallacy here is that when you, when you make it easier to finance an asset, you actually drive up the price of that asset. So that's why home prices have been going up. That's why college tuition has been going up uh, is because uh, if you increase the amount of financing going into it, you enable the demand side of that market to bid up the price. Uh, and it's not, um, you know, it's not rocket science, but uh, politicians do this because it helps them get reelected. It's very popular to do because uh, people don't think it through um, all the way or they're thinking of through short term. Um, and then the commercial banks are profiting, you know, off of all of this loan origination uh, going on. So um, all this to say that people have liabilities and um, there's, there's this uh, view among Bitcoiners I've heard, which I'm very sympathetic to that, you should uh, pay off your liabilities before you buy any Bitcoin, um, which, okay, that's, you know, it, uh, to me, that's a very risk averse view. Uh, if you have a 30 year mortgage and the interest rate on it is three and a half percent, then you're basically saying that the returns from holding Bitcoin instead of paying down your mortgage principal balance um, are going to be less than three and a half percent a year over the next 30 years. Um, whereas, you know, over the past, you know, five, six, seven years, whatever it is, it's been 50% a year on average. So um, even if you think that it's irresponsible, my observation is just that people are going to do this. People are going to not pay down their mortgage principal and they're going to buy Bitcoin instead. Um now, it's funny, I, I've had strange messages from people where they uh, rever try to reverse engineer this, where they tell me, hey, I took out a big mortgage uh, so that I could do a speculative attack. And I'm like, well, you bought a house with it, though. You didn't buy Bitcoin with it. Uh, so that, 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 that doesn't work uh, at all. Uh, you're, you, what you got to do is you got to buy as little house as you can get away with. And then you take out a 30 year mortgage on it. So then you're, and then you, you know, have as little uh, of your payment going towards the principal, maybe even interest only. Um, and then you buy Bitcoin with all the money that you're not spending on your mortgage payment. Uh, and uh, it's really about not paying down your mortgage principal. It's not about uh, increasing your mortgage principal. Um, yeah. 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 The only thing I'll throw I'll throw back there is what if you sell your current house to unleash the equity, right? And then whether you take on a mortgage to take on a buy a same house of a similar value, lower fiat value, or even higher, but now you freed up equity to buy Bitcoin, and and now you've taken on additional debt, right? Then you, I think they're banking on that debt being priced lower in Bitcoin terms in the future as well. So there's that. Um, if, if you downsize your house, that's even better. Uh, you could also take out a home equity line of credit on the equity in the house um, or uh, cash out refinance your mortgage. Uh, so those are, um, those are ways of getting more capital to put into Bitcoin. 
Um, but just going out and buying a bigger house to have a bigger mortgage balance, uh, that does not work. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing though, is that, um, you know, this principle is not specific to mortgages and homes. So you can apply this principle to, uh, and I, that's L E, uh, you can apply this idea. I don't want to confuse it with the, uh, the loan balance. Um, you can apply this idea to any kind of asset. So Michael Saylor, he's applying it to micro strategy where you can lever up your business uh, and you can buy more Bitcoin uh, with that leverage. Now, there's caveats here. First of all, your, your liability, the debt you're taking on has to be long-term. It has to be like at least five years, right? Uh, otherwise, it's gonna come due uh, at a time where you might be still in a bull, bear, sorry, in a bear market, and you're having to sell your Bitcoin in a bear market in order to pay off your debt. Um, furthermore, it has to be at a low interest rate, and it has to be collateralized by an asset that is not Bitcoin. Okay, so uh, taking a loan out against your Bitcoin to buy more Bitcoin is extremely dangerous. Uh, because now, uh, you, if if the Bitcoin price goes down, you could get margin called. So you want to you want to use an asset that you're not going to get margin called on. So don't use your stock portfolio if your stock portfolio has shares of MicroStrategy in it, right? Uh, because the correlations there are going to kill you. Um, so it's it's pretty nuanced, and really, in my mind, and in reality who is going to do this the most of leveraging up and buying Bitcoin is large portfolio managers. It's the George Soros's of the world, okay, who have a portfolio of $200 billion worth of bonds and they can borrow at 0.1% against it for you know 50 years and they can just go market buy a crap ton of Bitcoin and they don't care. They don't care. Um, and th if, if, they, if they lose, they lose their bond portfolio. If you lose by you know, playing games with your Bitcoin or with your house, uh, you, know, you could be homeless or you could, get, you could lose all your Bitcoin uh, in leverage trading. So uh, really, in terms of who's actually going to execute the speculative attack, First of all, yes, there are going to be uh, plebes doing this, and it's uh, you know going to turn out poorly for them if they uh, are reckless about it. Um, but financial professionals who have risk models and who are playing with other people's money, uh, right? Who have a higher risk tolerance because of that, uh, they're the they're going to be the main drivers of uh, speculative attacks. They have the most capital, um, and it's best to just kind of. Um, you know, put your Bitcoin on your cold card, uh, buy it cash when you have the ability to do so, and kind of let the um, let the 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 big uh, whales uh, play the game of leveraging up to do a speculative attack. Um, is kind of the the point I would make there. Um, so the the other thing though is that when somebody borrows money from the commercial banking system. The commercial banking system is creating fiat. So when you get a mortgage from a commercial bank, they're creating that money out of thin air and they're lending it out to you. It used to be fractional reserve banking. Now there are no reserves. It's 0% reserve banking. So it's not even fractional reserve and they just create all the money out of thin air. And so that's really the key mechanism of a speculative attack is that when George Soros is borrowing dollars to buy Bitcoin, he's amplifying the problem, right? That there's too many dollars, he's creating more dollars. And there's too few Bitcoin, well, he's taking more Bitcoin off the market. And so um, one way that regulators could stop this is if they were to say, you're not allowed to borrow dollars in order to buy Bitcoin. Um, but that's very hard to enforce because money is fungible. 
So you don't necessarily, uh, that kind of capital control uh, is, is, is tough, but uh, yeah, that's, we'll see. Uh, yeah. On an individual level, is there an ethical component to this? You know, is it unethical to borrow from your local bank, create dollars, which may, I think some could interpret as making your neighbors poorer? Um, yeah, so you're, you're diluting the, the savings of your neighbors. Um, now, um, you know, when you have things like the government printing trillions of dollars and, uh, you know, it's like, okay, well... There's the accelerationist perspective, which is that um, you're actually helping your neighbors because the faster you dilute their savings, the sooner they adopt Bitcoin. Uh, and so the sooner they start accruing uh, hard money savings. And so you're actually doing everyone a favor by bringing the future forward uh, and, you know, ripping off the Band-Aid, essentially. Uh, so you have an ethical obligation to leverage up <laughs> and buy lots of Bitcoin. Um, you know, I and. Yeah, the 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 ethics of all this stuff gets pretty hairy because everyone's got their own financial situation. So like, it's different if you're doing this as a single person versus if you have a family, for example, with financial obligations, right? Um, it's different if you're doing this as a high earner, right? Who's got like a big six figure salary versus somebody who's scraping by on a five figure salary. So all of these things come into play where um, the ethics of it, but also the risk riskiness of it, uh, it varies a lot between different people. Yeah. You know, one of the things you said on our Thanksgiving special was that just, you know, the, the impact of 0% interest rates on, on humanity and, and sort of our long-term outlook. And I'm wondering if you've had even more time to reflect on that, you know, as time is, you know, I don't know if, if you think that maybe a lot has changed since the fall or maybe nothing's changed and, and what kind of uh, trajectory we're on with interest rates and its impact on, on people. Yeah. Um, I think that on the fiat side, uh, nothing has changed. Uh, but on, on the, on the Bitcoin side, a lot has changed uh, and that we saw a significant acceleration of Bitcoin adoption uh, since uh, our Thanksgiving special. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I also, I think that there's, there, there was an issue in earlier this year that drove up interest rates um, for fiat in the crypto world to like 20%. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, everyone was talking about the, the contango there. And um, I've heard that that actually won't be an issue next time. And so uh, more fiat will be able to flow into the Bitcoin uh, uh, trading system uh, much more quickly. So I don't know. I think that um, it's going to be crazy uh, when the bull market comes back and uh, the the animal spirits turn around. Uh, so I, I, if it's anything like past cycles, right, it always peaks in December. Uh, so, um, you know, expect a, a parabolic rise uh, to December. Uh, but, you know, maybe maybe it'll be different this time around. What do you, what do you make of liquidity in the marketplace? Uh, how much... Uh, in terms of historically, is there more liquidity now? And, and what does that mean for Bitcoiners or just or uh, markets? Yeah, I, I definitely think there's there's more liquidity now. Uh, what that means for Bitcoiners um, is that it, it's increasingly less expensive to interface between the fiat world and the Bitcoin world. And um, that really, if if we talk about the utility of a money, it's number one utility is its liquidity. And so uh, if you don't have enough liquidity to accommodate somebody buying and selling a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin without moving the price, um, then you're limiting the, the number of people who can adopt Bitcoin basically, because uh, somebody like Michael Saylor, um, you know, people debate whether he raised the price or not, or how much effect he had on the price. Um, but nevertheless, like as more billionaires, as more large funds come in, 
if they can look at Bitcoin and say, okay, we could reasonably allocate like 10% of our portfolio to Bitcoin um, because it is highly liquid, uh, then they'll, they'll, they'll do that. And it's kind of a paradox where the easier it is to sell your Bitcoin, the more you want to hold your Bitcoin because you know you're going to be able to sell it in a pinch. And so you're comfortable with holding a larger quantity of it. Um, and so that's, that's where having an increase in liquidity is good for, for everyone. Yeah. I want to also quote back to you your words from this article, because I think it kind of sums up or encapsulates a lot of our, our mindset or approach to Bitcoin when we first got started and, and how it evolved. Your quote, slow bleed leads to currency crisis as the expected value of Bitcoins solidifies in people's minds. At first, they are conservative. They invest what they can afford to lose. After 12 to 18 months, their small stash of Bitcoins has dramatically increased in value. They see no reason why this long-term trend should reverse. The fundamentals have improved and yet adoption remains low. Their confidence increases. They buy more Bitcoins. They rationalize. Well, it's only one to 5% of my investments. They see the price crash a few times due to bubbles bursting or just garden variety panic sales, it entices them to buy more, a bargain. Bitcoin grows on the asset side of their balance sheet. You know, I really think that kind of um, speaks to a lot of our experience with Bitcoin as our conviction grows. And, you know, a lot of us then kind of jump more towards how Bitcoin will become mainstream and eventually hyper-Bitcoinization. You know, now with El Salvador attempting or looking or, uh, you know, adopting Bitcoin, I can't speak for how far along or real it is in practice, but uh, it seems like things are accelerating. Yet at the same time, uh, you know, it's not so much uh, changing the whole world's perspective at once, like the Berlin Wall coming down yet. So I'm kind of curious where you think we are in terms of Bitcoin adoption and and cycles and whether this is sort of a a super cycle or if this is, you know, one of many or a few more cycles to come. Uh, Yeah. So um, I don't know yet. I I keep going back and forth on whether this is uh, the last cycle or if there's going to be more cycles uh, after this. Um, And uh it there there is a point where there is a critical mass and uh it goes now i i don't know also that saying this is the last cycle is the same thing as saying that this is a super cycle uh so you know we could have a super cycle where bitcoin skips past 100k you know goes to like 600k or something ridiculous or uh you know somehow busts through a million and then uh crashes back down um But uh, it's definitely, uh, to me, El Salvador, part of why people were uh, not jumping on it as like being uh, world changing on the day of the announcement is that they had this cynicism because of things like Cyprus. And I actually think that El Salvador is the real deal uh, compared to uh, Cyprus. Um, and so, uh, perhaps the, the, you know, people took that lesson to, to, to be a, a, a fixed thing that, you know, any announcement about countrywide adoption is nonsense, uh, to being, um, it's actually, you know, sometimes it's nonsense, sometimes it'll be real. Uh, and that this is kind of the first real one. Uh, I also think that it was very well-timed that, uh, if it had been announced at 60k, it would have been uh, the optics would have been pretty bad. Um, but that it was announced, you know, after a very strong correction, uh, and arguably, you know, it's not really going to go down much further from here. I don't, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball in front of me. But um, that if they adopt it now and and it goes up a lot in value, that it's going to cause a domino effect uh, of other countries adopting it as well. Uh, And then 
then we can start thinking, well, maybe this is more than a super cycle and it's a final cycle. Uh, and it, it's also, I think it would be good to have this be uh, the final cycle because it's really, it's an arms race with the central bankers, the BIS, the, um, the FATF people um, who uh, are trying to clamp down on Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Um, and the sooner that this happens, the better. And um, they need to be caught off guard. But uh, the, the more time that we give them, uh, then uh, the more actions they can take. But I don't know. I don't know how much action they can actually take. Uh, I think that they can they can just scream about it. <laughs> well, speaking of actions they can take, I'm kind of curious on what you think of, you know, sort of uh, eviction and mortgage and rent moratoriums and uh, stimulus and what seems to be sort of now monthly stimulus with these child tax credits for families and what, what seems to be the, the beginning of UBI. Yeah, I think that's the, the end state of uh, fiat. Um, is uh, UBI and then a steady acceleration of UBI because obviously uh, people uh, will sh scream bloody murder if you reduce it and um, politicians will win votes if they uh, promise to increase it. And so um, I definitely think that uh, that's going to continue to amplify. Now, the cool thing is, you know, this UBI is going into like Dogecoin and uh, uh, speculating on GameStop shares. Um, so it's hard to, that that to me is kind of the, the, the crux of this is that there's no way to target where the money goes. You know, you can say, well, we only want it to go to people who really need it. Um, but guess what? If you're handing out free money, everyone needs it <laughs> and uh, people will stop working. Right. So that they do need it. Um, and it's just it's it's folly. Uh, we've known it's folly forever. But the, the game theory of fiat um, is inevitably leads to this. There, it's very hard to politically argue against printing money. Um, and it, that that argument never wins. Uh, the the only thing that wins is um, you know uh, something like Bitcoin or like gold, but yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, I was really struck by something Daniel Prince said, where he was he kind of tweeted about how these all this stimulus is actually just a bailout for the banks for for the capital class, and 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 where we can't pick and choose where it goes. Where, we're, where, we're, where certain people need it to go is to pay their rent or their mortgage, which then goes to people who need to pay their mortgage or their rent on, on bigger loans uh, to keep the banks solvent. I thought that was an interesting perspective. And I'm kind of curious, and it's kind of touched on what we talked about before, but does money printing destroy value or steal value? Uh, both. It does both. Um, so it it destroys value because it causes people to consume or invest in things that they otherwise would not. And so the difference between what they get pushed into the investing in or uh, consuming and what they would have invested in or consumed, uh, that's the value destroyed by the money printing. Um, and then the theft, the redistribution is, um, you know, the dilution and the Cantillon effect of, okay, the first recipients of the money benefit from it disproportionately. Um, and there is also a value destruction there as well in the sense that uh, the way that people get fresh new money is by engaging in proof of work. Uh, what does that proof of work look like? It looks like uh, lobbying, right? Hiring lobbyists, uh, and uh, paying for uh, dinners and, uh, you know, paying for votes or whatever it is, uh, that's also a value destruction because uh, you're not actually creating any value. You're just um, spending resources in order to print more money. Yeah. I, I want to touch on, you know, how we've experienced 
crises of either economic or military uh, for the last, you know, every seven or 10 years, there seems to be something flare up of a very major kind. And I'm curious whether, you know, around the Iraq war, you know, whether you've looked into that and whether that has, you know, uh, whether, whether that was more related to the main, uh, you know, desire to maintain the petrodollar system and, and, you know, whether there was uh, interest by Iraq to, to deal in euros for oil and, and then compare and contrast that to with COVID in 2020 and, and whether that is more an economic crisis m- more so than a health crisis and whether that's the I'm even wondering if that's to cover up Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, I always I, I love a good conspiracy theory, uh, and I'm I'm a fan of them. Um, I I and I've heard the same with like Libya that uh, Libya was going to um, stop uh, doing dollars and they were going to use a a new gold currency, and that's why uh, Gaddafi got um, you know wrecked. Um, but. Um, I, I haven't. I I'd need to see more uh, more evidence for it. Um, I, I the the evidence for it seems rather circumstantial, and also um, it's I don't know. I, I I've read a good amount about the the war in Iraq and whatnot, uh, and I just don't think that's where the motives were. Um, mm. That would assume to me it implies that. Uh, somebody like George W. Bush has like a long term view of uh, of USD maximalism. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think that's the case uh, at all. Um, it also assumes it, it, it kind of assumes as true the utility uh, maximalism uh, argument, which is that, um, you know, if if we if oil contracts are denominated in dollars and thus dollars have more utility and thus people will hold more dollars. Right. Um, and I, I think that's um, nonsensical as well. Uh, so I don't think it's related. Um, and uh, but I do I do like the idea of uh, using it as a rhetorical device when people say, "Oh, you know, Bitcoin is bad for the environment." It's like, well, how can it be worse than the petrodollar, uh, right? Which is just like uh, pure CO two emissions, right in its name. Um, or when they say that, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin wastes energy, it's like, well, OK, look at the U.S. military that wastes a lot more. Um, so there's definitely like rhetorical arguments uh, that, that stem out of that that are fun to use. But I don't think that it's actually uh, uh, that the um, geopolitics uh, have been driven by a desire to have the dollar be uh, the world reserve currency. I think that actually. Um, the the dollar being a wor- world reserve currency um, is a accident of history and um, was actually it had more to do with how the chips fell after World War II um, rather than some kind of nefarious design by the insiders. Interesting. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts on the internet are right, and whether the internet is a super sovereign entity. Uh, conceivably, yes. I mean, we we even see this with regards to like Facebook and Google of people saying that, oh, Facebook and Google are like above the government now or that they own the government. Um, so um, the if... if if we take the internet, I, the internet at the end of the day is still um, privately owned servers and privately owned uh, fiber optic cables. And so there's definitely, um, rather than being a super sovereign, I would say that it is a, um, yeah, I, I, it's hard because it still has a physical nexus. Like it still exists in the physical world in specific jurisdictions. Um, but because the internet can route around censorship, uh, and, uh, that it is decentralized in the sense that you can put a server anywhere in the world and you can do, um, jurisdictional arbitrage, uh, that, that does enable it to, to, to avoid or, um, be more powerful than any individual sovereign, uh, that I think is definitely the case. Uh, and, and Bitcoin piggybacks off of that. Yeah. 
does the so the nexus of the internet and government kind of drive us towards one government? Um, I don't think so because uh, governments hate each other, uh, and that's why that's why they have to have things like uh, diplomatic protocols because they're 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 so incompatible with each other that they have to have like basically a a way of uh, a formal way of interacting. Otherwise they just go to war immediately with each other. Um, and so, uh, and you know, people have been trying to do world government stuff with like the UN and whatnot. Um, it just, it, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hold together particularly well. Like even if you look at like, UN peacekeeping missions, right. Um, you know, how, how many, genocides has the UN prevented <laughs> versus how many genocides have they like been on the ground, observed, and were not allowed to intervene because yada, yada. Uh, so I, I'm very skeptical of uh, anything about uh, governments cooperating like that. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying there. I appreciate the levity. I'm kind of curious if you think that there's a chance or if even humanity is forking and what I mean by that is going, you know, there's groups, two groups going in different directions in terms of the way they see the world and the way they interact with the world, whether that's vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin or just the news or technology. Uh, yes, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the blue pill, red pill dichotomy, maybe that's the two groups. Um, is is it's going to continue to amplify and um yeah i think that there are going to be a lot of people who are basically going to be traumatized by bitcoin success and um they um they for for a number of different reasons uh first of all the government should always control the currency right it's kind of part of their their ideology and that it is undermining the ability to deficit spend and raise taxes. So already it undermines their political agenda uh, and uh, they can't do anything about it. That's, that's the part that I think is going to hurt them the most um, is that no amount of protesting in the streets or, uh, you know, voting or of activism will change Bitcoin. <laughs> so uh, th that is going to be really hard for that group of the population to adapt to. Um, but thankfully, most people don't belong to that group. Most people are actually pretty pragmatic. They're just trying to improve their lot in life. They're just going to adapt and, uh, you know, make money and do well for themselves. Um, and that's going to be like 80% of the population. But there's definitely going to be uh, a sizable percentage of the population that just can't cope and they're going to be super salty. Um, and it's funny because Bitcoiners talk about, uh, oh, you know, we, the, uh, the minority will have to flee to the citadels. Uh, that I actually think the inverse will be true, that the, um, the, the, the ideological Keynesians will be outnumbered and they, for their own sanity, will essentially have to uh, exit society and enter into monasteries uh, where they can read Keynes on their own uh, and not have to, to face the reality of the Bitcoin standard. Yeah, um, it, interesting stuff there. And I'm kind of curious, you know, uh, what you think about in terms of, I mean, this is, uh, I think, you know, you mentioned that El Salvador is the real deal. And, and, and Jack Mallers or Jack Mahler's is, is a really key piece in that puzzle. Do you think he's, you know, something like an enemy of the state? Is his life in danger? You know, is that the kind of revolution that's actually happening on the ground here? Um, you know, it, I'm just kind of curious because, you know, with things like with meme stocks and, and we talk about, um, sort of like these, these notions of Weimar everywhere? Um, so I think in the Hollywood version of this, uh, yes. Uh, and, you know, that um, there's uh, uh, 
the 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 insiders the cabal is you know hiring hitmen to go after jack or something like that um but that's in the hollywood version i think in, in reality um they the the insiders are stuck in a paradox the paradox is that either they take bitcoin seriously in which case for them individually it makes more sense to defect and to go buy bitcoin because they 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 see the writing on the wall and it just makes sense that they would they'd get rich by holding bitcoin um or, or they don't take bitcoin seriously and you know they look at what jack's doing and they think well, this is ridiculous it's a country with like six million people who cares and and it's so volatile that all these people are going to get wrecked and uh you know it's the nicaraguan or sorry not the, the, it's the el salvadorians who are going to hate jack and who are going to send hitmen uh on him because he just wasted all of their money on uh some stupid ponzi scheme and so they they are uh that that's the 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 problem that the insiders have is that they um they either can't take it seriously or they take it so seriously that they become bitcoiners uh, and that there isn't really an in-between where um, they take it seriously and they think that they can take action to stop it. Yeah, I appreciate the levity there. It, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, you hear notions of like Patrick Henry and give me liberty, give me death. And even Jack said, I will die on this hill. And, and I, I really do think that, you know, it is, a, you know, you mentioned on, on our show on Thanksgiving, there are some things worth dying for. And that was in the context of, of even zero interest interest rates and and sort of this notion of what lives should be protected and at what cost. And and I'm kind of curious. Another thing you said, uh, it was a tweet, uh, or actually I think you said it on another podcast where your boldest prediction going into 2021 was that over half of the S&P 500 would own Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Um, and I loved it. And, and I think the key word there is boldest. It's not the most realistic prediction. It was the boldest prediction. And I'm kind of curious now going into you know, the second half of 2021, if you have any sort of uh, bold predictions for uh, Bitcoin going through the rest of the year. Um, yeah. So uh, just to update on, on that prediction, um, Part of me is like, okay, well, we're already halfway through the year and there is seemingly has not been any progress in uh, getting to half of the S&P 500. The other half of me, um, you know, sees that this would happen when it's going parabolic and it would happen all at once, right? The, I agree. It's not, it, it, the year's not over. Yeah, the year's not mm -hmm. over. I agree. So, uh, I still am leaving that prediction open. My heart's still in it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm still boldly predicting it. Um, if I were to add another um, bold prediction, um, by year end, let's see. Hmm. Yeah, I think that um, all, all of the major commercial banks well not all of them let's say let's again do half half of the commercial banks will allow you to buy and sell bitcoin uh you know on their website what does that mean does that mean i'm going to bankofamerica.com and i can convert my fiat my cash into bitcoin through their interface yeah yeah uh, um and we're we're the now why i i here's another one i agree with you it's like why wouldn't they do that and and I, we can get into sort of the um, the esoteric arguments of why they wouldn't do that. But from a, just a, an economic perspective, they would make transaction fees on that. They, it would be a service they'd be providing their customers. They'd be just eating into other markets that already exist. Um, so it's a no brainer to me. I, I, I love that one just as the other. And there's at least about well, one day less than six months to go. And um, I still love that you released Speculative Attack on July 4th. I think there's a lot of meaning there. The fact that you use that, I think it's the picture of the Joker, which I think even reached more prominence years after that with, with further movies. Uh, that picture and that sort of um, 
that theme just it, it speaks volumes and the fact that you wrote it in 2014 um I, i'm just blown away i i always enjoy talking to you please uh you know i i leave the floor to you for any final words and let anyone know, everyone know where they can find you yeah sure thing uh so thanks for having me on uh folks can uh, find me on twitter uh, at Bitcoin is saving or at Pierre underscore Richard, uh, depending on whether you want to uh, follow my my ship posting or my, uh, you know, uh, announcements. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that um, speculative attack is holding up well uh, as a historical uh, article. And the only part that really I think does not hold up well is um, there. there's a specific section where I try to answer the question of when the speculative tax will happen. Um, and let me bring it up here uh, because um, I think that I attached a specific number to it even. A market cap of at least $50 billion. And so now we're at a market cap of a trillion dollars, <laughs> and uh, we uh, have not seen a, a, you know a real serious speculative attack yet. Um, and isn't, so, the, isn't the whole thing a speculative attack? Arguably, yeah. I mean, it's the same argument that um, Bitcoin's been in a bull market since two thousand nine. Changed my mind, <laughs> uh, and that um, it's all uh, it's all uh, speculative attack after speculative attack. Um, but really, I think there's 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 the final speculative attack, right? The one that they can't fight off, um, and that you know we'll have to wait longer than I thought uh, because fifty billion dollars apparently is not a big enough market cap to do that with. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Maybe it'll be uh, five trillion dollars, and I was only off by hundred x. <laughs> do Do you feel like a Bitcoin OG now? What I mean by that is just you've been around the block, you've been here, you've seen some things. Uh, so to me, the term Bitcoin OG is, um, ru ruined by, uh, Bitcoin OGs who turn into shit coiners. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm scared. That's what I'm getting at. I mean, you're, yeah. you're the one who hasn't, or not the one, one of. One of, yeah. That haven't, but it's not, it's a rare breed. Yeah. And then the other outcome for a Bitcoin OG is just turning into an influencer. Um, uh, and uh, that also is a scary prospect uh, as well. Um, and I don't know. I just, uh, I, I've got my message. Um, and that's really what uh, I want folks to focus on rather than how long I've been around. Like to me, the, the value of my argument should not depend on what year it came out in or, uh, you know, anything like that, but rather... Uh, what it is that I'm saying, the logic of it. I, I agree with that in terms of the idea is the idea, but the fact that the idea was stated earlier in time gives some credibility to the person giving the idea. And that, you know, then you say, okay, what other ideas do they have? And, yeah. and you still research and do your own, uh, you know, verification. I'm kind of curious, uh, was that part of the move to Bitcoin as savings to move more towards your words and ideas and, and, or are you going to disappear at some point? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to disappear. Um, it, it really, yeah, it's, there was this weird thing going on of, um, it, it, it felt like there was uh, a bizarre level of attention to, me and who I am and the, you know, people asking me like, Hey, you're going to be in Miami. Um, and I was like, well, I don't like, I, I don't want this to be about my, my personal brand or anything like that. I literally just want to talk about Bitcoin and savings technology. Uh, and, uh, that's, that was, uh, a big motivation there, uh, for doing that on top of like the, the impersonators, um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, yeah, the, the scamming going on there. Um, yeah. And I, I started it as an experiment to see what it would be like. Uh, and I quickly felt like, uh, it was better than using my real name for, uh, you know, my daily shit posting. So, uh, yeah, I, I like it a lot and, uh, I'd encourage everyone to, to be more pseudonymous, um, not, not out of like OPSEC because obviously people still know my name and whatnot. Um, but more about, uh, staying focused on the mission 
and um, recognizing that like Bitcoin doesn't depend on any of us individually uh, and that it's really um, a global massive movement at this point. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought it was a bold move and mad respect. My final question, part F. Uh, recently, I saw you retweeted uh, the P. Rizzo's obituary on, uh, on NP. Yep. And, and what is, I'm assuming that he, you know, something about that meant something to you. And, and what did, what was that about? Yeah. Um, I always have to preface it with, with MP Mersha Popescu was uh, a very flawed human being. Okay. So uh, he said some things that were very offensive. He, he, he would make death threats uh, and uh, just overall uh, not, not great. Um, however, there were things he wrote that were true uh, and that were um, stated with a level of clarity uh, that it remains unsurpassed um, in uh, his understanding of uh, Bitcoin's philosophy and of um, what Bitcoin means for the world. Um, and so he was one of the early folks that um, I uh, learned from. Uh, and uh, yeah, so his, his passing was definitely... Uh, bad news uh, in in my mind. Although for others, you know, they they see him as somebody who uh, didn't contribute any value and was you know just a terrible human being. Um, but I think that 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 view is as equally myopic as lionizing him as you know uh, being uh, the best person in the world um, because. Uh, you, you got to look at, and it's weird, you know, there's, there's some folks who um, only like they denigrate the written word. So to them, like, uh, you know, writing a blog post is meaningless. And uh, that uh, on the other hand, writing a line of code or being on TV, uh, that is meaningful. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't see the world that way. I think that um, uh, he definitely influenced uh, Bitcoin uh, far more than it, his critics uh, are willing to admit or willing to um, understand and research for themselves. Yeah, uh, wild times. I, you know, it was kind of news to me. I wasn't very familiar. I haven't been around as long as you. I think that Bitcoin months are like years and Bitcoin cycles are like lifetimes. And I think a, a, a true testament to living a lifetime is seeing someone born and pass away while you're within one thing, whether that's a physical neighborhood or a, a cyberspace community like Bitcoin. And, and I think that's just a testament to how much you've seen and, and been a part of and witnessed. Uh, and so it's a longer road than some of us have been on. So I really appreciate you sharing all your thoughts with us. It's great to catch up with you, Pierre. I, I, I'm already excited to catch up with you again the next time. Uh, thank you so much. This has been so dope. Thank you for having me on. This was a really fun conversation. Pierre Richard back in the house for the fourth time, dropping serious knowledge on Bitcoin FOMO, ADHD, post-internet stress disorder, and speculative attacks on currencies right here on the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. And thank you for listening. If you dug the show, make sure to subscribe, share, and learn. Stack stats, stay humble, and get your shit together. Winter is coming faster than you think. This is Cedric. Peace.